Well, here we are at the uh, Bernie Sanders event in Minneapolis. We're just waiting for the Senator to arrive right now. This is one of those rare moments on North Star Oasis when you get a chance to actually have a presidential candidate on the very week that we are actually talking about him. So here we are, we're just waiting and let's find out. in this campaign, 
a campaign which is calling for a political revolution in this country. Today, 
than at any time since 1929. The issue of wealth and income inequality is the great moral issue of our time. It is the great economic issue of our time. It is the great political issue of our time. And we are going to deal with that issue. And let me be very clear about this. And let me tell this to the billionaire class that today has it all. There is something profoundly wrong when the top one-tenth of one percent, not one percent, one-tenth of one percent, owns almost as much wealth as the bottom 90 percent. There is something profoundly wrong when 99 percent of all new income generated today goes to the top one percent. There is something profoundly wrong when in recent years we have seen a proliferation of millionaires and billionaires while the average American is working longer hours for lower wages and we have the highest rate of childhood poverty of any major country on earth. When one family in this country owns as much wealth as the bottom 130 million Americans, this grotesque level of income and wealth inequality is bad economics, it is unsustainable, and this is the type of rigged economy which America is not supposed to be about. This has got to change. And working with you together, it is going to change because we are going to create an economy that works for all the people and not just a handful of people. On the top. But it is not just income and wealth inequality, it's more than that. Today in America, what we are seeing is that over the last 40 years, last 40 years, the great middle class of this country, once the envy of the entire world, has been disappearing. Today, despite expanded technology and explosion of technology, and a huge increase in worker productivity, median family income is almost $5,000 less than it was in 1999. In my state of Vermont, and I'm sure in Minnesota, we have people who are working not just one job, two jobs, three jobs, trying to cobble together an income and some health care. That is not what this economy is supposed to be about. The truth is that unemployment in America is not 5.4%. That's the official statistic that you see when you pick up the paper. If you include those people who have given up looking for work and those people who are working part-time, real unemployment in America today is close to 11%. Youth unemployment is 17%. African-American youth unemployment is off the charts. Today, shamefully, we have 45 million people who are living in poverty, and many of them are working 40 or 50 hours a week. Today, today, we are living in a nation which has more wealth than any nation in the history of the world. But the problem is that almost all of that wealth is going to a handful of people. 
The truth is that in the last 30 years, there has been a huge redistribution of wealth. It has gone from the middle class to the very rich. And what we are saying today is enough is enough. We want that wealth to come back to the working families. on Citizens United, the American political system has been totally corrupted and the foundations of American democracy are corrupted. What the Supreme Court essentially said to the wealthiest people in this country, to the billionaire class. What they said is, are you guys already own much of the economy? Now we're gonna give you the opportunity to own the United States government and state governments all over this country. And that is precisely what these people are now trying to do. American democracy is not about billionaires being able to buy candidates and elections. It is not about the Koch brothers, Sheldon Adelson, and other incredibly wealthy individuals spending billions and billions of dollars to elect candidates who will make the rich richer and everybody else poorer. There was recently a media report which suggests that the Koch brothers themselves, one family, second wealthiest in America, one family will spend more money in this election cycle than either the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. Brothers and sisters, that is not democracy, that is a movement toward facing the world. When we talk about our responsibilities as human beings and as parents, and I've got four kids and seven grandchildren, there is nothing more important than leaving this country and this planet in a way that is habitable for our kids and our grandchildren. community is virtually unanimous. Climate change is real. Climate change is caused by human activity. Climate change is already causing devastating problems in our country and around the world. And if we do not get our act together in years to come, the situation will be substantially worse. What the scientists are telling us if we allow business to go on as usual, by the end of this century, the planet Earth could be five to 10 degrees Fahrenheit warmer, more drought, more floods, more extreme weather disturbances, more rising sea levels, more ocean acidification, more famine, more disease, more human suffering. We must not allow that to happen. Exxon, Mobil, and all the big oil companies and the Koch brothers and 
that make a lot of their money in fossil fuel, they want us not to address this issue. But we understand that as caretakers of our environment, as people who enjoy the beauty of our country and the planet, we are not going to allow them to destroy this planet for their short-term profits. One of the challenges that we face, and it is a huge challenge, huge challenge, is that the American people are very disillusioned with the political process. They are very demoralized. In the last midterm elections, 63% of our people didn't vote. 80% of young people did not vote. And all over this country, people are hurting they're worried about their kids, they're worried about their parents, they're worried about what happens to them when they get old. And they look to Washington and they say, hey, those people, they're not dealing with the realities of my life. And they listen to the media and the television talk all about political gossip and all kinds of crap, and not talking about the realities facing ordinary Americans. Media looking at politics as if it were a baseball game or a soap opera rather than addressing issues as to how we transform America. What we need to do, in my view, and I'll do it with your help, and we have a website which is going to get better in minutes called berniesanders.com. We want your ideas, we want your feedback, so we're going to go forward together. But essentially what we need to do is create an agenda, a very clear agenda, that makes sense to working families all over this country as to what the government should be doing to transform our country and improve lives for our people. What I want to do now in a few minutes, and you'll forgive me, I'll be pretty brief and move pretty quickly here. I want to touch upon what I think should be an essential part of a progressive agenda. And the first issue out there is when you talk to people, when you go up to people, when you do polls, what people always say when you ask them what is the most important thing on their minds, it's a four-letter world called jobs. Jobs. And the reason they say that is they know that unemployment is much too high. They worry about their kids being able to get a decent job. They worry that at the age of 50 they're going to be laid off and not be able to get a job that pays them half the wages they're currently earning. So in my view, we need a major federal jobs program that creates millions of decent paying jobs. infrastructure is crumbling, when our roads, our bridges, our water systems, our wastewater plants, our airports, our rail, our levees, and our dam need an enormous amount of work. We have got to invest heavily in rebuilding this infrastructure, and when we do that, we make this country more efficient, more productive and safer, and we can create with a $1 trillion investment, which I have proposed, up to 13 million decent paying jobs. <laughs> it is not only a question of creating jobs, which we have to do, it is a question of saving and preserving jobs. You are looking at a United States Senator who has voted against trade agreements like NAFTA. <laughs> they voted against NAFTA and CAFTA and permanent normal trade relations with China. And I'm going to help lead this opposition against the Trans-Pacific Partnership. That since 2001, in Vermont, in Minnesota, and all over this country, we have lost almost 60,000 factories and millions of decent paying jobs. We all know 
who wrote these trade agreements that every corporation in America and the drug companies and Wall Street write them. And what their goal is, is to create a situation where they can shut down in America and move to low-wage countries. And our job is to tell them that we want trade agreements that are fair for American workers and workers abroad, and we want them to start creating jobs in America, not just in other countries. Let's also be clear that millions of American workers are working in wages which are much, much too low. The current minimum, federal minimum wage of $7.25 an hour is a starvation wage we have got to raise it to a living wage. As some of you may know, the city of Los Angeles recently raised the minimum wage there to 15 bucks an hour over a period of few years. They did exactly the right thing. Establish pay equity for women workers. It is indefensible, it is unacceptable that women doing the same work as men make 78 cents on the dollar. That's got to change. Respect the working people of this country and know that every worker in America has paid sick leave and guaranteed vacation time. Now when we deal with income and wealth inequality, what we have to understand it's not just that the wealthiest people in this country and the largest corporations are doing phenomenally well. What we also have to understand is that we have a tax system which is written by these very same people and is grossly unfair. So let me be very clear and let me tell all of the billionaires who are watching that TV, if I'm elected president, you're going to start paying your fair share. Back to campaign 
finance reform and this disastrous Supreme Court decision, let me just say this, I've said it before and I say it again. If elected president, there will be a litmus test for my nominees to the United States Supreme Court, and that is they will overturn this disastrous Now some of you may know and some of you may not know that shamefully the United States of America today is the only major country on earth that does not guarantee health care to all people as a right. And together, we're going to end that disgrace. Despite the modest gains of the Affordable Care Act, Today, 35 million Americans still lack any health insurance and millions more are underinsured with large copayment and large deductibles. Our health care outcomes in this dysfunctional and wasteful health care system in many ways, in terms of longevity, how long we live, in terms of infant mortality, is much lower than other countries around the world. And then on top of all of that, we end up spending almost twice as much per capita on a dysfunctional healthcare system which charges us the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. Enough is enough. It is my view, and something that I believe from my first day in politics decades ago, that health care must be a right for all of our people, and we must move toward a Medicare for all single payer program. And think, and 
think of what it will mean, not just to young people who are going to college, to know that they'll be able to think about what it means to kids who are in the sixth grade or in the first year of high school. Because they will know that if they study hard, if they take their academics seriously, they will, in fact, be able to make it into the middle class. They will, in fact, be able to get the jobs that they have dreamt about. And on top of that, in this legislation, what we have also done is to say that we are going to substantially lower interest rates on student debt. Let me touch on one other issue. I am the ranking member uh, of the Budget Committee, uh, which means the leader of the opposition. And I want to tell you something. Media kind of forgot to report this, so I will mention it to you. At a time when our middle class is disappearing, at a time when families in Minneapolis and in Vermont are having a hard time feeding their kids, at a time when elderly people are forced to choose between heating their homes in the winter or buying medicine or getting the food that they need, at a time when working class families cannot afford to send their kids to college, here's what the Republican budget that passed Congress last month does. It throws 27 million people off of health insurance. Throws them off. It ends the Affordable Care Act. It makes a $400 billion plus cut in Medicaid, which will heavily impact families whose parents are in nursing homes and take away health care from low-income families. So instead of figuring out how we provide health care to all, they throw 27 million people off of health insurance. The Republican budget cuts Pell Grants by $90 billion over a 10-year period, making it harder for young people to afford college. The Republican budget, at a time when families are having a hard time feeding their kids, cuts food stamps, the WIC program, nutrition programs, by billions and billions of dollars. And to add insult to injury, the Republican budget gives huge tax breaks to the top two-tenths of one percent by repealing completely the estate tax. Get out of there! Get out of now this may be the priorities of the Koch brothers and the other billionaires who control the Republican Party. That is not our morality. Those are not our priorities. And for those people who say that we've got to cut Social Security, that we've got to cut benefits for disabled veterans, we say, over our dead bodies. cutting Social Security or Medicare or Medicaid, but in terms of Social Security specifically, you know and I know that there are a lot of seniors and people with disabilities out there who are trying to get by on twelve, thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars $14,000 a year, barely doing it. Instead of talking about cutting Social Security, we're going to be expanding Social Security. <laughs> Instead of talking about cutting Head Start and child care, we're going to be talking about universal, affordable, pre-K education. <laughs> now, I think some people out there may say, well, you know, what Bernie's talking about is kind of expensive and it's kind of radical. But let me tell you really, 
it is not. And what I hope very much, you do not get caught up in the mindset that is so pervasive around our country today. And the mindset is, well, we have a deficit. Should we cut education by five billion or 20 billion? And the liberals say, only cut it by five billion. Should we throw this many people off of health care or that many people off of health care? Should we give this big a tax break to the corporations or only a little bit of a tax break to the corporations? We have got to change that mindset and that worldview. In the wealthiest country in the history of the world. In the wealthiest country in the history of the world, we have got to think big and have a different vision for what this country can be. And that big We have seen trillions of dollars over the last 30 years transferred from working families and the middle class upward. And that is the premise under which we begin this discussion. Can we afford as a nation to provide free tuition in colleges? Of course we can. Can we have a high quality, excellent childcare system which is affordable to working families? Of course we can. Can we join the rest of the industrialized world and have a national health care program guaranteeing health care to all of our people? Of course we can. poverty of any major country on earth? No, we don't. Do we need to have an e economic situation where 99% of income goes to the top 1%? No, we don't. So what my hope is, is twofold. First of all, to repeat, Bernie Sanders can't do it alone. We have got to do it together through a strong grassroots movement. We have got to, in our own minds, in our own hearts, imagine a nation and a government which works for all of us, not a government dominated by a handful of billionaires and campaign contributors and well-paid lobbyists. We can create that America because when we stand together, there are a heck of a lot more of us than them. Well, there's Ber Senator uh, Bernie Sanders for you as his speech has ended. It was around an hour in length as we just brought to you. The one thing that you've heard in Bernie Sanders' uh, speech today is that he did a great job in pointing out a lot of the problems. He actually reminds me of the first politician I've ever heard speak live, and that was uh, the late Senator Paul Wellstone back when he was just a challenger. The thing about Minnesota, like in Vermont, is there's a huge populist movement. And what you're going to find is in this state in particular, Bernie Sanders might actually have a sizable base, but it's a long campaign. He points out a lot of problems. What are his solutions? Are they good for uh, America? Are they good for Minnesota? We really don't know because he didn't really offer too, many in the way, too much in the way of solutions, but I guess it is a long campaign, so there's a lot that we're going to learn. But it's going to be interesting to contrast how Senator Bernie Sanders does in this election cycle compared to the likes of Martin O'Malley or Hillary Clinton. From judging what we see here today, we know that Bernie Sanders can give a good speech. We know he knows the Democratic issues. He, we also know that he can resonate with the Democrat base. Is that going to be enough to sustain him through the independents and uh, the people who are not ideologically aligned with him? Who knows? That's why we have a thing called a political campaign. But it is actually refreshing to hear Senator Bernie Sanders and uh, see what he can do 
this early on in an election cycle. And honestly, if I were Hillary Clinton, I would be scared of Bernie Sanders right now. Something to keep following here on North Star Oasis.